Good morning. This is Dr. Wael Yindi, Phalmology Consultant in the Giza Memorial Eye Institute for Ophthalmic Researchers. Today I'm going to be talking to you about reversed relative afferent capillary defect. In order to understand uh, the reversed relative afferent capillary defect, we must also understand the relative afferent capillary defect in itself. In order for us to have uh, to elicit a relative afferent capillary defect, we must have three principal findings. Two pupils, left and right, intact efferent innervation for both pupils, and a defective afferent innervation in one eye. If we have the three, then we can elicit a relative afferent capillary defect. In the following illustration, we will give an example of a patient with left afferent papillary defect and explain on that example how to elicit relative afferent papillary defect and how to elicit reverse relative afferent papillary defect when... So, our patient has a left optic nerve defect, which gives us an afferent papillary defect in the left pupil relative to the right pupil. Left pupil has an intact efferent innervation. To elicit a relative afferent pupillary defect, now we have two pupils, the left and right, that we have them. An afferent pupillary defect in the left eye, as we said, and an intact efferent innervation for both pupils. So when we move the light towards the right eye, as we can see, we get constriction in both eyes. You move the, right, the light to the left pupil, you get dilatation of both pupils. So, Let's concentrate now on the left pupil, which has the relative afferent pupillary defect. Light, when it moves towards the left pupil, it dilates. When it moves to the other pupil, away from the left, so you get the left to constrict. Light towards the left gets dilated, away gets constricted. What is the re reversed relative afferent pupillary defect then? A reversed relative afferent pupillary defect becomes useful when the eye that has the afferent pupillary defect, the left eye in our example, has another pathology preventing pupillary movement totally. For example, it has a third nerve palsy or a total posterior synechia. So this patient has a left dilated fixed pupil because he has an afferent pupillary defect and also efferent pupillary defect from third nerve palsy or let's say posterior synechia, whatever. So now because we have a diet fixed pupil in the left eye, it's not going to give us any clues, but the right eye will give us all the clues we need. So we observe the right eye, and when the flash of light is pointing to the right eye, we'll get a constriction, and then the flash moves to the left eye, because the left eye has an afferent defect, the right eye will dilate. So back to the right eye, you get a constriction, because this is the direct light reflex, and when you move it to the left eye, away from the right eye, to the left eye, it, the right eye will dilate. Can you see? This is exactly the opposite of what, ha what was happening in the left eye when it had a relative afferent pupillary defect. So that's why it's called the reversed relative afferent pupillary defect, because it, the opposite happened. So this slide concludes what you see. When, when you have a relative afferent pupillary defect, when the light is moved directly on the eye that has the relative afferent pupillary defect, it dilates. When it's moved to the other eye, the, the eye with the relative afferent pupillary defect will constrict. While in the reversed relative afferent pupillary defect, when you move the light directly to the eye, it, the pupil will constrict. But when you move the light to the other eye, the pupil will dilate. Do you get what I mean? It's, it's, it's the opposite of what happens with relative afferent pupillary defect. That's why it's called reversed relative afferent pupillary defect. And uh, this concludes uh, our explanation, and uh, I hope it was uh, handy and uh, useful to uh, everybody. Thank you.